I am going to be ranking all 20 drivers using my own custom tier list. Now this has become a bit of a tradition on my channel. I try to do it kind of once a year around this time and it's always a lot of fun and really interesting to see how my opinion has changed or stayed the same about a driver relative to last year and just in general how I feel about drivers and how they compare at the moment. Now as always I'll have this tier list uh, linked in the description box down below so you can go and do it for yourself and if you do end up posting it on Instagram or Twitter or something then don't forget to tag me as well. It's a lot of fun to see how my tier list uh, compares to yours. Anyway let's get into it. Now, in terms of the tiers, I'm not really going to explain them, to be honest, because, I mean, for the most part, they are pretty self-explanatory. And also, I think as we go through them, uh, I think I'll probably explain them a little bit in terms of, you know, which drivers go in which one. So, yeah, that might be a little bit more uh, easier. Now, first up, we have got Nico Hulkenberg. Now, of course, uh, returning for 2023 after taking kind of a couple of years on the sidelines. Um, also doing a few kind of cameo appearances for Racing Point and Aston Martin. I have probably got him in quality midfield drivers. I feel like, you know, only just because I feel like that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty decent tier as I think we're going to, we're going to see with some of the other drivers, but I think he, he has actually, I think, surprised a lot of people. There was, there was a lot of skepticism actually last year when, uh, when it was announced that he would replace Mick Schumacher, obviously a guy who was on the sidelines. Many people thought that, why would he, you know, why should he get another opportunity? He's had his time, but Listen, quality drivers are quality drivers, and Nika Hulkenberg has proven that in 2023. I think he's been the faster, more consistent driver at Haas. And just in general, uh, when we'll get to, you know, Kevin Magnussen a little bit later on, I think the combination of those two, that, you know, that's what Haas need, because that team is not suited to young drivers. It certainly wasn't suited to two rookies in 2021, and even having kind of a more experienced driver and a younger driver last year in Mick Schumacher and K-Mag, that, that was not a great dynamic at the team. So with two experienced drivers, I think the team's in a great spot. And uh, in terms of Nico Hulkenberg, you know, that car's been tricky. It's been up and down. There's no doubt that it's been better in qualifying than the race, which, you know, doesn't make it easy to score points. But I think in qualifying, Nico has shown some really fantastic flashes uh, of pace, which is great. And I think he's still, again, exactly, you know, like that tier says, he is still a quality midfield driver. And next up, we have Daniel Ricciardo. Now, Something else I should say about my tier lists, and I've been consistent actually throughout the years, is that this isn't just necessarily what these drivers have done this year. I kind of take a two-year uh, a two-year period in terms of how I judge these drivers because I think sometimes it kind of takes away some outlying, you know, bad seasons. And so the weird thing about using my kind of two-year gap in of uh, judging drivers is that. You know, Ricardo was basically kind of sort of fired by McLaren last year or bought out to basically not drive for the team. And he's literally done two races in 2023. So the thing about Ricardo is that as I'm sitting here right now before the Qatar Grand Prix, you know, he's not going to be racing until at least Austin. So I can only really put him in something to prove because the last time we saw him, you know, again, he's only had two races in the Alpha Tauri. And when I look back last year, he had a horrible season with McLaren. So I don't, you know, what I'm trying to say with Ricardo is that I do think he has something to prove. And I think a lot of people were perhaps surprised that, you know, the fact that Liam Lawson, who actually isn't uh, in this tier list, by the way, because, um, you know, I, I tried to only kind of do it for the full-time drivers for next season or, you know, this season. And Ricardo is kind of technically the full-time Alpha Tauri driver. But I think a lot of people were surprised, actually, and a bit frustrated, actually, that Liam Lawson didn't get the opportunity over over Daniel Ricardo because, you know, of the way Lawson just, just hit the ground running. So... I do think that Ricardo, even though he is a quality driver, and I know for a fact that when he does get a prolonged, you know, period of a, you know, a decent amount of races in the Alpha Tauri, he is going to do a really good job of that. There's no doubt, you know, he's going to get into the tiers above, but at the moment, I can only judge of where the drivers are at the moment and what I've seen previous. I can't, I can't judge him on what Ricardo is going to go on to do. So at the moment, I do think he is in something to prove because, you know, he is coming back after being dropped by McLaren and he's only had two races. So yeah, it's too early to judge. But listen, this guy in two years time could be in a Red Bull. He is going to be very hungry to, you know, beat his teammate and do a lot of damage when he gets back. The good kind of damage, obviously, uh, in terms of scoring points in the kind of upgraded Alpha Tauri. But yeah, certainly for the moment, I know Ricardo is a fan favorite but I can't put him in any higher than something to prove kind of based off what we've seen, you know, the two races that we've seen and also his 2022. Next up now, ah, okay. Next up, I have got Logan Sargent. Now, unfortunately, Logan Sargent uh, is going to be the only driver that, um, that is in the Latifi category. And, uh, you know, to kind of keep it plain and simple, the Latifi categories of drivers who at the moment or over the past couple of years just haven't justified being in Formula One full stop. 
you know, Logan Sargent, unfortunately, I know he's a rookie and I know that there was there was a lot of backlash. I mean, I was someone who was quite, not critical straight away. I think I was, you know, a little bit critical after about five or six races. I tried to give him a few, uh, you know, a few races to, to show what he's got. And then certainly when it came to the mid, you know, to the summer break, I made a video obviously about him where I was quite, quite critical that he is under pressure. And listen, a lot of people, I know, you know, I, I always say this, I read the comments and a lot of people in that video were massively critical of me kind of, you know, putting that pressure and expectation on his shoulders, given that he is a rookie. But Listen, the fact that Lawson has come in and straight away with no testing, the fact that he's hit the ground running and scored points, that has put a hell of a lot of pressure on Logan Sargent. And at the moment, as we sit here, he has not done enough to basically, he has not done enough to justify his place at that team. He's not done enough to justify his place in Formula One. You know, that Williams is a decent car and ultimately he just, yeah, I, I don't think he's done enough at the moment in terms of stringing together weekends. There's been kind of moments of pace and moments of promise, but it just hasn't been enough. I'm not saying that he won't be kept on by William, Williams because the options, you know, the alternative options aren't exactly great. But yes, unfortunately, he is in the Latifi category and he will be the only driver in that category. But listen, he's still got the rest of the season. As I've said on so many occasions, his future is still in his hands. It's not as if Williams are, it's not like Haas last year with Mick Schumacher. It's not like Williams are actively looking for replacements for Sargent. They want him to succeed. They want him to, to do the best he can, but yeah, at the moment, he's just not doing enough to, to secure his seat, and he doesn't look like he belongs in Formula 1 with how competitive uh, the grid is at the moment. And next up, we have Valtteri Bottas. Now, he's a really interesting one where I am going to put him in solid but replaceable because I feel like that's what Valtteri kind of is. He is a solid enough driver, but there's no doubt that if, if Sauber, who of course are turning into Audi in a couple of years' time, and obviously the uh, Alfa Romeo, unfortunately, uh, we're losing that name uh, next season... You know, Bottas is always going to be a solid driver because, you know, he's a, he's a race winner, he's a very experienced driver, just a solid pair of hands, and I think, in general, in terms of team chemistry and the experience that he brings, I think he does a good job, but there's no doubt that I can't put him in the quality midfield drivers because I do think that he can be easily replaced. I mean, I can think of a lot of drivers right now that could step into that Sauber and do, I think, a better job. I think the combination of him and Joe are... I think they're almost getting a bit too comfortable with each other. I think that I think something needs to be kind of thrown into that team, a bit of a firecracker, a bit of a just someone who's going to push Bottas just a little bit more because I feel like he's almost a little bit too comfortable there as well. So, yeah, I've been impressed, you know, with Valtteri at times. I think the beginning of 2022, at the beginning of these regulations, when Alpha got to a really good start, he was absolutely quality, but he just isn't consistent enough. I think he's been a bit too quiet sometimes. The beginning of this season was also not great. It's difficult to judge how much of that is down to the driver and the car, but at the moment, I think Valtteri, he, again, he's a solid driver, but as the tier suggests, there's a lot of drivers that I think could replace him and do a better job. And I'm actually going to say the same of the next driver, which is K-Mag. Now, I don't have too much to say about K-Mag. I think I would put him in the tier. Him and Nico are so close. And maybe some people might think, you know, especially at the end of the video, once we put all of the other drivers, maybe people will think that I'm being a bit too nice to Nico Hulkenberg, putting him in the tier above uh, K-Mag. But I think last year, you know, K-Mag got a little bit too comfortable, almost similar to Valtteri. I think he got a bit too comfortable with, you know, Mick Schumacher as his teammate. I think the team saw that. And one of the reasons why they brought in Nico Hulkenberg for this year is because they wanted to give K-Mag a bit of a kick up the backside. So yeah, he's not had a bad season by any means, but he's definitely had an inconsistent season. I think, again, similar to Valtteri, there's been, you know, flashes of pace and he has scored points on a few occasions, but there's no doubt that Nico has been the better driver. I think K-Mag has kind of struggled with how the car has been developed. He's talked openly about the fact that it's not really suited uh, to his driving style, but the drivers have to adapt. You know, the team finds performance in the wind tunnel and the driver has to get the most out of whatever whatever package they are given. And unfortunately, I think K-Mag has just kind of, you know, slipped below those standards uh, this season. He's still been a good driver, no doubt about it. Again, still solid. Um, but yeah, he's definitely, I wouldn't say that he's one of those drivers that is, you know, just absolutely a stalwart at that team. I think he definitely is replaceable. And before his contract, you know, did get announced, there was a few rumors kind of in terms of who potentially could go in that team. But of course, Haas, I think with the sensible decision, uh, decided to resign both of their drivers. But certainly if his performances, you know, if he's, if it, if it continues in 2024, uh, looking at what kind of season he's had uh, this season, I think his seat could be under a lot more pressure next season. Next up, Max Verstappen. I don't really have too much to say about Max. I mean, 
what do I say about him? I mean, he's just been breaking all of the records, hasn't he? As I'm recording this, he's probably going to wrap up the uh, the championship uh, and of course his third uh, driver's title uh, in this uh, next race not even the next race actually the sprint uh, is going to be uh, is going to be more likely and yeah he undoubtedly is in the best of the best category you know he's at the top of his game absolutely in his prime he, you know that combination of him and red bull has genuinely been unbeatable uh, Singapore is just going to stand out as a total anomaly this season because, you know, winning all of those races and breaking Sebastian Vettel's uh, nine race record, uh, nine straight wins in a row. Yeah, what can you say about Max? He is undoubtedly the yardstick at the moment in Formula One. And, um, yeah, he definitely, if there's anyone deserved, that deserves to be in the best of the best category, it is Max Verstappen. Next up, Esteban Ocon. I think he's had a very, very good season, actually, Alpine. I'm going to put him in a quality midfield drivers because... I don't think he is a borderline, you know, borderline champion. I don't really see him as that. I think he's just the rung below. I think when you look at, even though he did beat Fernando Alonso last year, I think everyone saw that Fernando had a lot more bad luck and there was a bit of a quality difference between him and Fernando. There was definitely kind of a tier difference uh, between the two drivers. I think he's done a really good job up against uh, Pierre Gasly and I kind of, actually, do you know what? I'm going to put Gasly, who's only uh, two drivers next. I'm going to put both of them in the same tier because I genuinely think they are so closely matched. I mean, even when you look at their career, they have a very similar amount of race starts, both race winners, both have had podiums and I do see them as very, very close drivers which I do think is very good for Alpine, for all of their troubles this season, for, you know, with all of the managerial kind of upheaval and all of those changes, I think their drivers are actually really, really solid and have done a great job. However, when it comes to both of them, obviously both of them have now scored a podium this season, so, you know, that's fantastic, but I don't see either Ocon or Gasly as good as drivers as they are challenging for a world championship. I just don't think they're quite that caliber but that doesn't mean that they're not, again, as the tier suggest, quality midfield drivers, and they will continue doing a great job uh, for Alpine uh, next season as well. Uh, next up, we have Carlos Sainz. Now, he is someone who definitely is in the borderline champions. I think he's definitely not in the Max Verstappen tier. Of that, there is no doubt, because when you look at the past kind of couple of seasons, yes, he, he is a driver who is very smart, and yes, he has improved, I think, uh, as the kind of last couple of years have progressed, certainly as we've kind of gone through this brand new generation uh, from 2022 onwards. He's definitely driving, I think, better than ever before. He's been unbelievably consistent. Um, you know, definitely, I think, the better driver compared to Leclerc this season. I'm sure, you know, Leclerc fans will probably disagree there, but I think this has been one of Sainz's best seasons, but... I still go back, and the reason why there is no way that he's in the Max Verstappen category is that I still go back to last year and the beginning of last year when Ferrari did have a championship level car and unfortunately Sainz just wasn't on that caliber. He wasn't able to adapt to it. Uh, he had a bit, you know, there was a few mistakes. He, he was still driving well enough and was scoring a lot of podiums, but when he was given a championship level car, he wasn't able to kind of raise his game. Now, obviously, I know that he's learned a lot since then. He's a much more developed driver and he's a very, you know, he's a very focused driver, very smart, very analytical. So I'm sure that, you know, the next opportunity he does get in a championship level car, he is going to be better. But that question is still there. You know, in a really good midfield car, we have seen that he can win races. Uh, you know, obviously, the only other race winner this season, apart from Red, the Red Bull drivers, uh, with that great win in Singapore, but when that pressure gets ramped up, is he really going to be able to, you know, take it to max in a championship level car? I think those questions are still lingering in the back of my mind. But undoubtedly, I think he is a borderline champion because in the right situation, under the right circumstances, with the right teammate, I could see him challenging for a championship, no doubt. But yeah, he does. he's not quite in that Max Verstappen category. Now, Charles Leclerc. I think I've said about this, uh, about Charles Leclerc before, where... I do think that I would rate him better than Sainz, but he almost belongs, and I've said this before, like, he almost belongs in his own category, like, the Charles Leclerc category. He's not quite on the level of Max, but he is better than Carlos. Now, Carlos is now, of course, beating him in the championship, and I don't think points, you know, tells the full story on, you know, in Formula 1, but you can't, you can't also kind of take that away from Carlos. He's been a little bit more consistent than Leclerc. Charles does have that kind of raw speed that I think when Charles is, and as we saw last year in 2022, or when Charles Leclerc is given a championship level car, he can take it to Max Verstappen. He can definitely be in that best of the rest category, toe to toe with Max. But I think with Charles, the mistakes are still there. They were there at the beginning of the season. Um, 
Actually, there was a great interview between him and Scott Mitchell uh, from uh, Scott Mitchell Mound from the race in terms of he knows very openly that he's made those mistakes and that's on him. So he is working on that. But I just can't put Charles just quite yet uh, in that best of the rest category. Again, to me, he kind of belongs in the kind of a weird in-between one because I do th I do rate him higher than Carlos. But at the moment, you know, in, in the present day, I think it's kind of fair to put him in that kind of borderline champions category. But yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing both, uh, both of the Ferrari guys hopefully have a better car for 2024. And next up, we have undoubtedly one of the most disappointing drivers of 2023, and that is Lance Stroll. And to really, I mean, he's something to prove for me. I think Lance Stroll, his stock has gone down so much this season, I think, compared to Fernando Alonso. And you'll see what, you know, where I've got Fernando uh, on this tier list in a, in a little bit. He has been so disappointing, Lance Stroll. I feel like, you know, Fernando coming in... Again, Fernando is coming into a brand new team, by the way. I feel like that isn't even a factor anymore. When usually, you know, when drivers go into teams, we say, oh, there's a bit of an adjustment period, you know, and they need to get comfortable. No, Fernando came in, and from, like, the start of the season, I know Lance came in kind of hampered with his injury, but it's been an embarrassing season for Lance Stroll. Like, he has... He has really held Aston Martin back so much. The fact that they had such a strong car at the beginning of the season and he wasn't able to score, you know, any podiums or even that many top six finishes. I think he's only had about, you know, two or three this season, which just isn't good enough looking at how strong that car was at the beginning of the season. And up against his teammate, he's really hurting that team. I mean, the fact that they could finish as low as fifth in the constructors behind McLaren, uh, it's... You know, I think it's been a real disappointment from Lance Stroll, and it's it's one of those questions that I've had for a very long time in terms of, of course, he's at that team because, you know, his dad owns the team and everything like that. I think Lance is still a decent enough driver. I feel like he's not, he's not in the Latifi category, for example, because if you do put him in an Alfa Romeo or a Haas or something, you know, maybe even a Williams, for example, I think he would be scoring points in kind of that end of the field. But the problem for Lance is that Aston Martin and fighting for podiums and kind of that end of the grid, kind of the top four teams, it's just out of his reach. It's out of his operating level. He is not that kind of caliber of driver to compete with the likes of Lando Norris, Fernando Alonso, Lewis Hamilton, George Russell, you know, Charles Leclerc. He just isn't on that level. And so he's completely outclassed when he's been given a car this good. And he's, you know, he's been exposed. You know, let's be honest, the pressure I think has really got to him. And, you know, even the mistake in Singapore, for example, Mike Crack came out and said that, you know, it just showed his commitment. The fact that, you know, he crashed, which to me was just a ridiculous thing to say, to be honest. But yeah, he, he's really had a disappointing season. He wasn't that amazing last year either. He did a good job up against Seb, but nothing amazing. And so I think he is in something to prove. I think if any driver deserves to be in something to prove, it's Lance Stroll, because not only does he not deserve to be in Aston Martin, but again... I'm not sure at the moment if he deserves to be in Formula 1. I think he does have something to prove. Uh, whether he feels that pressure on his shoulders because his seat is so secured, I think that's another question and another problem with Lance because maybe I think he's maybe too comfortable at that team. But either way, he's held back Aston Martin. I think he's cost them... I think by the end of the season, he might have cost them maybe two or three places in the constructors. You know, you're looking at over £30 million that Lance Stroll potentially has cost his team in constructors' positions. So, yeah, if anything, it deserves to be in something to prove. Lance Stroll is definitely uh, Lance Stroll more than anyone else. George Russell. Now, George Russell, to me, I'm going to put him in borderline champions. Now, let's get, you know, one thing out of the way. He has not had the best of seasons. The fact that he's been overtaken by Lando Norris... Uh, in the championship, I don't think that's that that's not a good look because you know even though the McLaren perhaps is the the strongest car on the grid at the moment, you know behind the Red Bull obviously, um, the Mercedes has been the stronger car kind of in general over the course of the season because of McLaren's slow start and so yeah it's not been a great season for George Russell but. I still put him in that borderline champions category because he is still a very fast driver. I think looking at last year, again, I tried to kind of look over a two year period to kind of for, for exactly like this kind of reason. And last year, the way he the way he came into Mercedes, integrated so quickly, got his first pole position, his first race win in Sao Paulo. There's no doubt this season that he's made a few more mistakes in Canada and Singapore was the big one and he needs to get rid of those. If he wants to be a world championship caliber driver, if he wants to be in the tier above, Similar to Leclerc, he needs to cut out those mistakes, and the one in Singapore was massive, not just in terms of the points that he lost, but also the little swinging points uh, that gave a few more to Ferrari because obviously Leclerc finished uh, a little bit, a little bit higher, and so 
Yeah, it's not been the best of 2023s uh, for George Russell, but he is still a quality driver. I think he is still someone who is going to develop into a world championship caliber driver. I think he's someone who could challenge her for a world championship right now. But there's there's still a few kind of more edges uh, uh, for to, to sand out of, of George Russell. There's no doubt about that. And next up, we have Lando Norris. Now, undoubtedly, the driver, you know, that's uh, that's in form at the moment. And similar to Leclerc, I mean, on the form at the moment... I mean, he is the most informed driver outside of Max Verstappen since the uh, Austria upgrades. He has scored the second most amount of points. The only problem with Lando, and I've said this every single time I think I've talked about Lando Norris, he almost belongs in that Leclerc category of, you know, maybe above Sainz and maybe above Russell, but not quite on the level of, of Max Verstappen. And that's ultimately because he hasn't yet been given the car to actually, to actually prove that in a championship scenario where you're under the biggest pressure, the biggest scrutiny, every single race, the team, there isn't an, an expectation of podiums. There's an expectation of wins every single race. And when you're tested under that different level of pressure, it asks something different as a driver. And Lando, he has completed the midfield. There's not, there's nothing else that he can prove with the cars that he's been given. He's a very, you know, consistent podium scorer when the car, when he's had a good enough car, but we haven't seen him in that title challenging car and i think that's the only question that i have of lando and it's not you know it's not his fault so i'm not saying i'm almost saying there's nothing more that lando norris can do but i can't put him in the tier above because he hasn't had the equipment to prove that you know he'll be able to kind of sustain a championship challenge over the course of a whole season so yeah for the moment i'm going to put him in borderline champions with the likes of signs leclerc and russell which i mean Listen, that is a very good, that is a quality group of drivers. I think any of those two, I mean, any combination uh, of those two is a fantastic uh, driver lineup, but I just can't put Lando yet on that Max Verstappen category because he hasn't been given the equipment to prove uh, that he can actually, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Max yet. Hopefully McLaren can give him the car that he deserves, a race-winning car in 2024. Next up, Alex Albon, one of the stars of the season. I don't think he's in borderline champions. I can't you know, beating Latifi and beating Sargent doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that you're uh, a borderline champion, but he is undoubtedly a quality midfield driver. The way, the way he's gathered that team around him. I mean, that is Albon's team now. And also how consistent he was, even at the beginning of the season when the Williams wasn't as strong as it is. Now, he has been... I mean, he is literally, you know, he is the reason why Williams are seventh in the constructors by himself. So, yeah, if anyone deserves to be in a quality midfield drivers, I think it's Alex Albon. I am very, very excited to see him hopefully also get a better car because, yeah, you know, since being dropped by Red Bull, he is just a different driver. He has reinvented himself. He has kind of established himself uh, within Williams. And there was a few kind of rumors during the summer break that... You know, perhaps in 2025, 2026, with the driver market being so open, could he be an option for McLaren, potentially Ferrari as well, if, you know, maybe science moves on or something. So I think a lot of bigger teams are looking at Albon and what he's doing and kind of, you know, scouting him for the future. And rightly so, he's been fantastic this season. I'd love to see him on the podium. I think that would be uh, incredible. But yeah, what can I say? All those Q3 appearances, all those incredible race drives where... Either he just goes on forever on his tyres because Williams never want to pit him. He's so good under pressure. I've, I think what he's done this season to uh, during stints of Grand Prix in all conditions and all tracks to score points in Zandvoort, for example, and also in Monza. So, yeah, he's just been a, a fantastic driver, I think, for Williams. And, yeah, he definitely deserves to be in that quality midfield driver's tier. And next up, I have got Yuki Tsunoda. I, I think Yuki has took a big step this season, but I can only put him in solid but, re but uh, replaceable because I think I was massively impressed uh, with what he did at the beginning of this year. I think he was so unlucky because I think he scored points twice, uh, in, you know, had two P10s, and then there was three other results where he was in P11, arguably at a time when Alpha Tauri had maybe the second worst car on the grid, maybe only ahead of Williams. Um, but unfortunately, I do think in the past kind of couple of races, he has been a bit unlucky in the likes of Singapore and Monza, uh, you know, being taken out by Sergio Perez and then not even starting the Italian Grand Prix. But I do think that he is lacking just a little bit of consistency. I, don't, I wasn't impressed by him at Suzuka. I thought that was a really big opportunity for him to have a, a good result and it didn't quite come together. So again, whilst Yuki is definitely now a solid driver, someone who I think deserves to be on the grid, there's no doubt that he is replaceable. There are other drivers. I mean, you know, plenty of drivers I look at on this list that I think, you know, could do a better job. And even though he has been confirmed for next year, I think that Honda, that Honda backing that he gets is absolutely massive. And had it not been for that, 
I don't think he would be at Alpha Tauri. I think the team would have just gone with Liam Lawson and Daniel Ricciardo. So yeah, in terms of what's in his future, he has got a massive season ahead of him in 2024 because not only is he going to have to prove that he is actually worth of staying in Formula 1, but he could also have a massive impact on Daniel Ricciardo's future in Formula 1 as well. So yeah, I think at the moment, I wouldn't want to put Yuki. I think he's had a very solid season, but again, nothing uh, nothing more than that at the moment. In terms of Zhou Guan Yu, now this might be just a little bit harsh, but I'm going to put him in something to prove. I think with the way that driver lineup has been, and I talked about it when I talked about Valtteri um, earlier in the video, I think those two are just becoming a little bit too comfortable with each other. I think Valtteri has just been the better driver, and I do think that, you know, I do think that it was quite close because Terre Porcher was obviously, you know, Sauber's young driver. He was definitely an option for next year. Obviously, Joe kind of just got it. But I do think he has something to prove. I think whilst he is a good driver, you know, maybe solid, yes. I think he's got more to prove than, say, the likes of Yuki, the likes of K-Mag, and the likes of Valtteri as well. And so that's why I've just put him in the tier below in something to prove. I think he's got a big season, uh, uh, you know, next year to prove that you know, going forward as this team kind of transitions to Audi, that he should be part of that future. And at the moment, I just don't think he's quite uh, doing enough. But again, he's had a very good season. I think considering, you know, that last year was his rookie season, he's made a kind of a good step, but he needs to make an even an even bigger jump up uh, next season and really be beating Valtteri Bottas if he wants to stay at Sauber slash Audi. And next up, I have got a very, very tricky driver. And to be honest with you, I am going backwards and forwards. I have got Oscar Piastri. Now, the problem with Oscar Piastri is I want to put him in quality midfield drivers, but I'm not. I'm going to put him in just the tier below. And I mean, listen, to be honest, for a rookie to be on the same level, in my opinion, as Yuki Tsunoda, Kevin Magnussen, Valtteri Bottas, that is a quality, you know, rookie season. And listen, this guy is special. This guy has got championship potential. Of that, there is no doubt. You know, that's why McLaren signed him on a long-term deal until the end of 2026. But I do think that when you compare him to Lando, again, keep in mind, it's only his rookie season. Um, he, you know, he's only scored, I think, a third of Lando's points, which is a pretty big gap between teammates. But again, that just shows how good Lando is. Not, not you know, that it's some kind of fault of Oscar. Again, he is just a rookie, but... Even though I really want him to put him, I mean, I, I absolutely love Oscar Piastri. I think he's been one of the best surprises this season. I can't wait to see him going forward. But out of respect to what these drivers have done kind of in their careers and over the past couple of, you know, over the past couple of seasons, you know, maybe it's a bit harsh because I've got, you know, Hulkenberg in there and Hulkenberg kind of only just uh, sneaks into that category. But I feel like just because it is quite early in his career, I'm, I'm still going to put him in solid but replaceable because ultimately, you know, at the moment, again, with where Oscar Piastri is right now, not where he's going to be in the next race or the next year because I'm sure he's going to improve exponentially uh, in his career. But right now, if you put, say, Pierre Gasly in that, in that McLaren, if you put Esteban Ocon in that McLaren, I think they're scoring more points than Oscar Piastri is at the moment. So that's my justification for not kind of bumping up Oscar to that next level, even though... Listen, this guy is, you know, by next season, he's going to be up here. There is no doubt about it. But at the moment, for a rookie season, which has been absolutely fantastic, I am going to put him in solid but replaceable. But again, he's he's super close to that next, uh, next tier list. I just kind of want to tamper expectations uh, just a little bit. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've absolutely loved uh, Oscar Piastri uh, in 2023. And next up on the list, I have got Fernando Alonso. And I'm seeing actually that Lewis Hamilton is right there uh, next to him. And so I'm going to do these both at the same time. To me, both of these are best of the best. I have said before on my channel, it's, you know, it's no surprise. I've made a video about this, I think, uh, earlier in the year that, in my opinion, still in Formula 1, in terms of speed, experience, and proven championship quality. Uh, that's just what, you know, the likes of Lando and the likes of Charles, that's just what they miss out, even though I think Lando hasn't quite yet had the opportunity. But in terms of that proven championship factor, drivers that, if I gave them the car right now, I would have zero worries in terms of are they going to be a championship, cha you know, a, a championship a contender or not. These three right now are to me still the most solid bear in Formula One. I mean, obviously Max, you know, he's, you know, he's proven uh, right now in terms of how good he is. Fernando Alonso, what he was doing at the beginning of the season, the fact that the guy, what is he, 42, 43 years old, I, I don't want to bring, I almost don't want to bring his age into it because I don't care how old he is, this guy is a freak of nature to still be doing what he is doing at his age and driving at the level that he is. 
I mean, some of the stats around Fernando, he has scored points in every single race this season, bar one, and that was the Singapore Grand Prix where he had damage on lap two. So you can see that consistency. He has reached Q3 in every single race this season. And at the beginning of the season, when Aston Martin did have the second best car on the grid, he was unbelievably consistent. He was not leaving a single result on the table. Uh, I think he got, what, five podiums in the first six races? And, and the only race that he didn't get a podium, which was in Baku, he finished just off the podium, uh, just behind Leclerc in fourth place. So even when he didn't quite have a podium-capable car, he still got the most out of it. And, you know, it's, it's a bit frustrating that the Aston Martin has dropped off, but... I mean, that podium in Zandvoort, what a race that was by Fernando. That lap one overtake, double overtaker on lap one. I think it was um, on both uh, George Russell and Lando Norris. Listen, you know, Fernando Alonso, he might not have the raw speed of Max Verstappen at the moment, but he is still, to me, in that best of the best category. There is no doubt about it. And I'm going to put Lewis right up there with him. I think, you know, Lewis, P3 in the championship. And actually closing on Sergio Perez in Suzuka, you know, the fact that he's in a Mercedes, which has been so up and down, I don't actually know how to rank the Mercedes this season. Has it been the second, the third, the fourth best car? I mean, it's been so up and down along with the McLaren, along with the Aston Martin, kind of along with the Ferrari, and still in such a tight midfield where we've had, you know, where we've had four teams all competing kind of for similar positions uh, behind Red Bull. The fact that Lewis is still third in the championship and actually closing on Sergio Perez, or whilst I don't think Lewis has had, you know, apart from his uh, apart from his pole position in Hungary, or whilst I don't think he's had kind of those uh, peak performances, you know, those kind of massive wow moments this season, those massive podiums, you know, he's had a few kind of there and there, but not as many as, say, Fernando. He has made up for it in consistency, and I think, like, his consistency has actually been a bit underrated. Again, he's third in the championship, and actually making gains on second, you know, he's pushing Sergio Perez to potentially finish second in the championship this season. And so, again, even though I think perhaps in qualifying he hasn't been, you know, at his absolute best, and, you know, he himself admitted that in, uh, in Singapore, I think he makes up for it so much in the races that... Again, you know, just like Fernando, just like Max, Lewis is still one of those drivers where if Mercedes gave him a championship uh, capable car, he would be right up there with Max Verstappen and Fernando Alonso. I have no doubt about that. And so the only reason that I put these three in kind of their own, their own tier above the likes of Sainz, Leclerc, Russell and, uh, and Norris is just that, we, you know, they're proven. We have seen them in championship capable cars and they're still good right now. So yeah, I think the, the drivers that do get close to me are Leclerc and Norris, but I'd be lying to I'd be lying to you if I said that I don't put you know those three kind of you know these three are just above uh, all of the others but it is so close and up at the top by the way again apart from you know apart from uh, Lance Stroll boy do we have such a talented crop of drivers up at the top I am so excited about all of these drivers last up I have got Sergio Perez and I have got him in quality midfield driver now there's no doubt that he's had a bad season especially with the car you know that he has at his disposal arguably the most dominant car in Formula 1 history, and the fact that he's actually, the fact that he's being caught by Lewis Hamilton for second in the drivers, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that is not good enough. Like, that should, that just should not be happening in a car that good, but at the same time, I don't want to kind of overreact and overcorrect and say that, you know, he should now be in this tier or, you know, that tier. He is still one of the most reliable drivers on the grid. He is still a solid, you know, a quality midfield driver. He has proved that throughout his career. And I just think that the pressure and the Red Bull environment and, I mean, with the stuff that Helmut Marko kind of said about him and, you know, Christian Horner a little bit as well, that is not a great environment to, to have a bad patch in. That's, you know, Red Bull... They're just not suited to kind of supporting that second drive. They do a great job at supporting Max, but it, it can't be easy to, you know, you know, be in that team with what Helmet Marco is saying about you and, you know, the xenophobic comments about where he's from and stuff like that and about his mentality. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's fully to blame for his performances because he's the driver. He is in charge of the poor season that he is, you know, that he's had. But yeah, I feel like it's important to kind of understand that and, and not disrespect Sergio too much in terms of how, you know, the poor season that he's having. At the very bare minimum, he is a quality midfield driver if he was in an Alpine or a McLaren, he would be he would be doing a fantastic job and maybe even have scored a podium this season. I don't think that's out of the question given you know given his uh, history in uh, in Racing Point and Force India. But I just can't put him at in you know in that tier. No way, he is not on the level of Lando Norris or Charles Leclerc. So. Yeah, at the moment, I've got Sergio Perez in quality midfield driver at the bare minimum. Yes, he's not having a bad season, but at the same time, 
let's not disrespect, you know, let's not disrespect Checo that he's, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, absolute terrible driver who doesn't deserve to be in Formula One. He is a quality, quality driver, but unfortunately he has not had a great season. Well, there you have it. That is my completed tier list. Let me know all of your thoughts in the comments box below. And once again, if you do want to do this tier list for yourself, then don't forget to check out the link in the description. And if you do end up posting it on Instagram or Twitter, then don't forget to tag me. It's always so much fun to see how my tier list compares to yours. If you did enjoy this video, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel. That would be massively, massively appreciated. And I'll see you in the next one.